Hello, and welcome to the FI Entrepreneur, financial planning for the risk taker. This podcast will show you how to achieve FI through entrepreneurial pursuits by developing a well-calibrated and thought-out plan for risk management so that you can maximize the rewards. Hosted by certified financial planner, enrolled agent, and serial entrepreneur, Ben Martinek, this is the FI Entrepreneur, financial planning for the risk taker. The information presented in this podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. None of the content is presented as investment advice. Consult your financial professional before acting on any of the information presented in this show. Hello, hello. Welcome to the FI Entrepreneur, Financial Planning for the Risk Taker. This is our episode on finances of a business plan. This is Ben Martinek here, meeting with you along with my co-host, Andrew Bensavanga, hailing all the way across the big pond. Well, you're not quite the big pond. You're on the other side of the world, right? It's about as far. <laughs> what do we call the, the Pacific? No, is it pretty big? No. <laughs> it's, the Pacific, I've heard, is pretty big. I've been over it. Yeah, it's about as far away as you could go. It's like that situation if you start just digging a hole in the ground. and you, I don't know where you would wind up if you started digging in North Dakota, but you might be near South Korea. You're saying it might be faster just to dig a hole in the ground and get to you that way rather than flying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's what we got going on. <laughs> With the delays in the state of air travel these days, I think it might be. <laughs> Andrew, I've never really thought about it, but you really are on the other side of the globe. So <laughs> what's it like over door there? Door to door. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's the next day. It's actually, you know, we're recording this for you. It's one day and for me, it's another, which is a lot of fun always. That is fun. Yeah, Andrew is in the future, everyone. So he'll uh, try to give us a forecast that we can use to our advantage. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send the lotto numbers to you. Yeah, our episode today, folks, is going to be a continuation of some of the other things that we've been going on. We're going to delve into the finances of a business plan. So we've talked about trying to raise money in the prior episode with Deb. And basically, you know, if you're looking to get a business off the ground, what would that look like? In this episode, we're wanting to start getting into the nuts and bolts of the business plan itself. And so, you know, and if you've been listening, you know that in my prior episodes, I haven't necessarily encouraged for you to get into the details of a business plan or maybe better stated how much of a business plan you need to get yourself into is dependent on the scope or the nature of the business that you want to get off the ground. Maybe a good theme or takeaway for you to have from this episode is, look, you know, not every business is the same. And so what every business needs isn't the same. So you need to be mindful of the business that you're wanting to get started and adjust accordingly. You know, if you're in the professional services business, there might be some freedom or flexibility for not having as much of a detailed business plan as part of your process for getting your business underway. But if you're looking to start a bar, a brewery like Andrew's done, or maybe some sort of manufacturing business, then yeah, it's more capitally intensive likely. And we need to really know exactly what you're getting yourself into from day one. The opportunity for learning and having some trial and error is going to be less forgiving. So in that mind, we're going to kind of break this up, I believe, into kind of two notions. You know, what's the business that you're wanting to get underway as we talk about that business plan? And then as always, we'll incorporate some of our own backgrounds, you know, what I've done, what Andrew's done, and talk about our experiences in this. How's that sound to you, Andrew? Are you ready to get this thing on the way? Sounds great. I'm going to try to keep up. You got a, a big head start. You're halfway on the, on the other side of the globe. So, <laughs> All right. What do we need to do for general categories for the business? So regardless of who you are, every business has some level of startup cost. Even if you're in a professional services business, like what I've gotten started, both between a tax business and a financial planning business, there's some operational costs that you're going to incur almost immediately. So you do need capital probably no surprise, but you do need capital to cover those costs. And, you know, you probably should have a pretty good idea as to what that monthly expenditure is going to be from day one, because unless you have revenue meeting you from the moment you get the business started, those costs are going to be there. And so you need to have something, some sort of reserves that you can burn off of that. But, you know, startup costs are going to vary. Again, if we kick over this to Andrew a little bit, let's have you talk about it. Andrew, you know, what kind of startup costs did you have when you got the bar or the brewery going? In our case, it was really an interesting situation because we were not only opening and starting a brewery, but we were also opening and starting a restaurant at the same time. Luckily, they were in the same space, so we didn't need two physical locations. And the funny thing was that actually wound up starting to hinder us in the end because having them both in the same location, they were you know kind of in the middle of the city, 
So we were paying a premium on the real estate. And we also, because of that, had limited the potential size of the brewery. So when the company started to grow, we couldn't expand the size of the brewery. So eventually, we not only outgrew the brewery space, but then also outgrew the restaurant space. But to bring it back to like the startup costs, you did in this situation just have a ton of physical equipment that you needed. The brew tanks, XYZ, and all that to get the brewery started. And all those things which had to be imported from overseas, but then all the physical accoutrement with putting together a restaurant and, you know, tables, chairs, dishwashers, stoves, you know, and even like, do you have any idea what a chair costs? (laughs) Probably not. (laughs) You know, it's pretty crazy. So when you start looking at all these things together, that was a very capitally intensive business on the upfront. And then once you get all those pieces in place, hopefully you're bringing in money pretty quickly. You know, you're getting people in the seats, you're selling beer in a couple of different manners. But I think those ideas can really be moved into any other business that you're starting to think about. You know, what are your upfront costs? And then how is the money coming in? So, I mean, in your circumstance, you had costs, you had quite a bit of costs and quite a bit of money that you had to dedicate to this purpose from the get go. I'm sure there was some training of staff. So you have that upfront cost, maybe a few weeks ahead of even the grand opening date. The good news is, is you can expense at least a decent amount of this off tax wise. So if you have, you know, officially what are called startup costs from a tax perspective, this goes as far as, you know, research and investigation and flights and well, the whole bit of what it might take for you to kind of consider what it is to get this business going up into what's unofficially described as the grand opening date. At that point, your startup costs transition into operational cost and the taxation or what you can deduct or how quickly you can deduct it more so will change. You know, there was, I'm sure, some labor training or staff training that was taking place. And so you had that initially. What did you do to try to get revenue in the door from day one as part of your, I would imagine, you know, very different from myself, Andrew, but, you know, quite frankly, I didn't really have much of a business plan. I didn't have no business plan, but I didn't have much of a business plan. And I'd be happy to talk about a little bit of how we got things going without, you know, just a kind of a bare bones business plan in place. But I would imagine in your circumstance, there was a lot more time going into this just because quite frankly, you've got more money shelling out the door and you're probably a little concerned about wanting to make sure that money makes its way to a good home. How did your business plan look and what did you do to try to bring revenue in from day one? So our situation, and I think the situation in the beer industry was a little bit unique in the fact that the company was already established before we opened that kind of flagship location. We did something which is called contract brewing. And that's where you have recipes, you have a brand, you have some marketing going on. And in that case, we also had a small brew pub that was already open. And we use that kind of as like our foot in the door to all these other things. So that was kind of like that small start, that quote unquote safer start. You still had money on the line, but you knew that you had an audience, you know, a consumer base built in already. And then the main money right raise came together to see, all right, where are we going to get the money to go and get the bigger space, the tanks and all that. And a lot of the business plan did revolve around looking at the other players in the market, looking at what they were doing, and really taking a look at what was in our immediate local area. Because then, of course, in the brewing space and the beer space, you've got a product that you're either going to distribute nationally, internationally, or really just over the counter in your hyper local area. So where you know, where are you selling your product really? When you start getting into those details, you're getting concerned about what is my cost as part of producing this product and then what what's the price point which we think we can sell it and ultimately what's our profit margin. Because you know, you ultimately don't want to go and really push a product in which the profit margins are tight uh, because it's going to be much harder obviously to turn a profit in that regard. In my own experience of running a business, a lot of this is we learn by doing. And that's something I've brought up from the first episode. You learn by doing. I wouldn't want anyone to get too caught up into these details and then not even try to start a business because you feel like it's too much and it's overwhelming. You learn by doing. So just get into the practice of having a business. Start small. It's going to be a recurring theme of ours. Try to start as small as you can. As you learn, you'll get better at this and you'll get into those details. You'll start to learn what those details mean and how they make sense. But, you know, we're kind of talking not version 1.0 for you, Andrew. This is kind of version 2.0 or maybe version 3.0. We're a little further along at this point in time in which you're launching this initiative. 
what were your guys' thoughts? Did you have as part of your business plan at this point in time details of, you know, what's it going to cost us to produce this glass of beer and what do we think we can sell it for? And, you know, if we sell so many of these in a day, this is the kind of profit we're going to have on a daily basis. But as you put this together and launched the business, had you guys at this point in your business plan gotten into those details or was that still a consideration further down the road? When we, we had the brew pub open and that was pretty easy. You know, those numbers were doped out pretty well because we were really just paying a third party company to go ahead and make the beer. And it was like, all right, they're charging us 50 bucks a keg. We know we're going to get 120 pints out of that. And then we're going to sell them for whatever we're going to sell them. And that's pretty easy. You also know, you know, a general rate of how many people you're going to get in the door in an evening, a general rate of consumption for a person, depending on how they drink depending on who they are, maybe 20 minutes per beer, 30 minutes per beer. If it's a younger person, maybe an hour per beer, blah, blah, blah. And you're able to figure that out pretty quick. Wait a second. So you're saying a younger person would have a lower level of consumption rather than a, is that a generational changeover that you guys had picked up? Seems counterintuitive to me. I would have thought it to be the other way around. It was (laughs) counter. It was, it seemed like it was more of like the coffee shop culture. Okay. And in my experience here in this market, the older people they went out and they were out to drink. You know, they wanted to have a couple of beers. And it seemed like a lot of the younger people, they went out and it was more like a socialization thing. They're having one beer, nursing it for an hour. And at that point, you're really looking, all right, who are we going to target? Who do we want at those tables? What are the specials that we're going to run to try to get these people in the door? Because you know what? You come in with your buddies and you drink two beers in three hours. I don't want (laughs) Sure. Right? (laughs) Like, I want to sell beer. I'm here to sell beer. There's a reason I didn't open a coffee shop It's not a library. So those numbers were pretty easy. What happened when, you know, you start to manufacture it yourself, the numbers are still the numbers, but it's like now you're buying water from the city, right? Your water bill is increasing. You're buying the hops, you're buying the malt, and those numbers kind of change. And in addition, it was, you know, we also didn't have a perfect business plan, but there's all these little hidden expenses that are, of course, going to pop up. You know, how are you getting rid of the spent grain? What happens when you don't have something that you need from abroad or something like that? So I think in all businesses, no matter how good your business plan is, there's going to be things that pop up. And it was like, now, if I was in a situation where I had to open up a little pub in this city, I could do it with my eyes closed, right? We did it five or six times. and I know how the numbers work. I know where everything comes from. But even that being said, like in the last place that we had open, a pandemic happened, right? You know, we were open for four years and one year was a pandemic with all forced closures. You know, you can't run a bar when you're being forced to close at 9 p.m., but we did it, right? So I think what I'm really trying to get at is what Ben said, you know, work on having a business plan. Start small if you can, but at the end of the day, you need to get into it to really know what it's going to look like. Yeah, there's just no way around that. I mean, your observation, ultimately, Andrew, that you know the younger crowd is going to consume less rather than the older crowd, and that that ultimately might change your business plan. And you could very easily have drawn another conclusion and had, oh, we're going to really go after the younger crowd because they're going to be the ones who are going to drink all this much. Well, you know, the reality is, is business will surprise you, and it doesn't go always the way you think it's going to go. And that's really the challenge of a big initiative. It's trying to get off the ground, and it's going to spend a lot of money from the very get go and needs all this financing for this to work is, boy, you better be really sure that you're right about what you're on and your solution and your gut is telling you because, you know, if you're wrong, you're going to spend a bunch of money and you're you're not going to have a business on the other side of it or it's not going to produce the profit or the revenue you thought it was going to be. And so, you know, I would only go into a really detailed business plan and a really detailed financing structure if you're certain, like really certain about what it is that you're trying to pull off and you don't have the freedom for surprises or whoopsies at a later point in time, or at least they cost more. Those oopsies become more expensive and they ultimately could put you out of business. And so really the secret, I think, to business is just getting into it and trying and pushing. You know, I, I don't know if I would just open up a business tomorrow without having put any thought into it. That's probably a bad idea. You, know, you obviously need to study this some and you should have some money put away to help get it going. But where you're going to really start to learn is in the operations and the day-to-day work of the business. And it's going to be after years of that, after we've had business version 1.0 and 2.0 and 3.0, that if at that point in time, 
now you want to really let's launch this. Like we really think we know what the numbers are and we've got a pretty good sense of what's happening in the market. And you can have that higher degree of certainty that I just advocated for. That's when I think this next level of financing and business plan makes sense, comes into play. Would you agree, Andrew? I mean, you pretty much have said as much, right? I mean, now if you were to do another business running a brewery, you'd feel really much more confident about how you'd go about doing it, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, with experience comes a lot more just the knowledge. And, you know, using the word knowledge, it's even kind of like insulting because it's not even knowledge. Now it's kind of like in your bones, right? The things that you could see, you know, I walk into a place or you walk into a place we both see different things. Like I'll be looking for choke points in the service staff, you know, things like that are, that are going on. If I walk into a kitchen or somewhere, you know, a bar, I see things differently than Ben would see them. And that only comes with time. So spending too much time getting into the minutia of a business plan, it might just not serve you well because you might just be focusing on the wrong things because you don't know the right things to focus on. And that's really important to be able to like realize that and not get too stuck on that. Sure. I think, yeah, you have the wrong assumptions and, you know, business, a nice trial by fire will prove what assumptions are true and what assumptions are wrong. And again, you don't want to be back in a big assumption with a lot of money and find out that, whoops, I was wrong. <laughs> that it costs money. Yeah. Putting together a beautiful business plan and then throwing a ton of money at it isn't a really great idea. And I think that's also why we love, especially me, like I'm kind of done with that brick and mortar model. I don't love being tied to one location. And then the pandemic really just drove this home for me. I don't love being tied to one location. I don't love being tied to one product and one geographic thing. I do now really love the idea of what Ben, you know, has more experience in the service services as a business, you know, financial planning, tax planning. And it's like in those businesses, you can start smaller, you can grow slowly, you can have it as a side hustle to begin with. And the money that you need to put on the line isn't as big to begin with, right? You're going to have your subscriptions, you're going to have your servers, you might have some contract workers, but a lot of it, you're not obligated to buy millions of dollars in equipment or anything like that. You don't need a warehouse. (laughs) You know, you need a fast internet connection, a good computer and a few monthly services and you can get yourself in business. Right. The challenge or the initial hurdle or obstacle to being able to be up and running is significantly a lot. So why don't we just take a few moments and talk about my own launching of Bonafide? Like, how did that come about? I mean, I did have some prior experience working as a conventional financial advisor with an insurance company. So I didn't start from day one and just launch the business. I do think of other financial advisors who have done that. Boy, I tell you what, that's a long runway. So (laughs) if you're going to go that (laughs) pathway, you better better be in a position for this to take a long time because there's a lot to learn and a lot to know and be some lean years. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I hope your spouse is bringing in some other income and you no one's dependent on you because I certainly would not go and jump into a business in which you're trying to run a business that you have no prior background or experience in. Like, that's a, like a sure recipe for failure. But I didn't have much prior experience. I had only worked previously about a year and a half wasn't particularly sold on that business model. If you listen to prior podcast episodes, I've gone into those uh, details some, so I'll spare that here. But the short of it was that wasn't working out for me. And I decided I was really making a decision on whether or not I wanted to continue on. And so I jumped back into doing some truck driving on the side as a way to kind of bring some money home. And then also to free up some time, as if you'd believe it, to start studying for the CFP exam. And it was really kind of at a conclusion of passing that CFP exam that I was trying to decide, okay, should I go and work for someone else? Or should I uh, start my own arrangement? And really, probably the big tug or pull for me of why I only launched Bonafide is, and this would be something that's worth looking, whatever business you're hoping to start is, what kind of association or industry support is there to help you get started? Close to the same time that I was getting launched was this new network called the XY Planning Network. They had just been up and running for the last year, and they were all about helping financial advisors start their own business that serviced only younger generation, the XY generation, rather than just baby boomers. And, you know, they were early on, but had a chance to have a few conversations with Alan Moore, who was one of the co-founders of that. And I just felt like, you know what, what they're doing, I believe in and I'm all about. So I hitched my wagon to them to get started. And part of why I suppose I didn't feel I needed as much of a business plan as part of working with uh, XY Planning Network is that's why I was paying membership fees (laughs) to be with them is they're going to help me figure out that business plan, I kind of figured, look, as long as I've saved enough money, I've got some experience in this, 
I'll work with X, Y, and they'll kind of work me through some of these details. And, you know, if you haven't caught on to it by now, I'm just a big believer of it. you learn by doing. And so I thought, look, I'm just, we've got an ability to be able to make this work and I'm just going to get in there and start figuring this out. So, I mean, I had some rough numbers, expectations of how long I could go without producing any revenue before this would become a bust. You know, I had a sense of a runway, had a sense of when this needed to turn around and come together. But I'll tell you, you know, what I had hoped the business to be from day one and who I thought I was going to serve and make a go of it, it's changed pretty dramatically from who our focus is now. You know, I really had it in my heart at the time to really service only a lower income, younger family who was just looking for some good advice that wasn't conflicted. You know, I think as honorable and noble as that is, as I've been in the business, I've just come to realize that that's not really a good market to go after. As good as those people might be and as much as they might need the advice, they're not really interested in your services or paying a price point that I needed to pay for me to make the business work. So, I mean, this is probably why I have so much reservation in saying, let's get a business plan together. I mean, I think it helps, the business plan helps to prepare you and at least get you thinking about this and to make this a serious endeavor and not just some idea that you're flirting with. But boy, I mean, there's just so much possibility for you to be wrong and for your initial ideas and concepts to be off that, you know, I don't think you should buy into your business plan too much. And I think you need to have some flexibility in your financial situation. But if things change, you can adapt to them and you change with them. I pretty much guarantee you your business plan is going to change. And you just need to have enough flexibility that you can maneuver or navigate that change, which is only what's taken place in my circumstance as time's gone along. And the good news is I've gotten better at being a business owner, you know, year by year, each year has gotten a little bit better, a little bit stronger. I'm a little smarter about what I'm doing. And it's reflected in the people that we're bringing home and the clients that we have and only how the business is growing and succeeding. So super excited and happy about where everything stands. But, you know, the business I have today, if anything close to what the business was when I first started it, and I think that's fine. What probably is most critical here isn't so much your own actual business plan. It's what do you have in place on the personal side of this, not the business side, but on the personal side of this to give you that runway that you need, the time that you need to become good at running your business. Because there's going to be a learning curve and it's going to be expensive and it's going to cost money. And what probably kills most businesses is not the business itself. It's that the personal needs of the business owner became too demanding and too critical on the business. And into crushing the business before it even had a chance to get underway. So it's managing the personal, I feel, is more important than managing the business plan. Like it's the personal side of this that really matters for pulling things together. Do you feel the same way, Andrew? Now, having shared some of my own thoughts on this, we don't need to share too much in the brewery, but do you think the personal was a big cause in terms of how that came together and went for you? The personal meaning your own personal war chest, the ability to run and operate and fail a little bit here and have enough money to keep food on the table. Yeah. Yeah. We were in a very lucky situation for us where, you know, cost of living was rather low. We all came from pretty good backgrounds where we all had saved up quite a bit of money. And, you know, we were able to kind of float ourselves. I wonder in your situation, did you get close to exhausting your runway when you first started out? How long did it kind of take where it was, you know, the business was producing enough for you or you weren't chewing up your savings? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Well, there was definitely times where you're nervous. You know, I tell you what, you know, the early weeks and months, you're fine to spend money. You've put a little money aside. That's what it's there for. But as weeks and months turn into longer months and longer periods of time. And (laughs) And you've got three clients, none of which are like really (laughs) wanting to pay you. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You start coming into, I mean, the real reality of being a business owner. I mean, and this kind of goes against, you know, the whole focus of being financial independence. This is the struggle. You know, this is where entrepreneurship will rob you of financial independence. You know, you'll struggle to sleep at night. I mean, that's really, I think this is kind of where this all comes home and you get tested in is, uh, you know, whether as much as you can intellectually and rationally say, oh, it'll be fine. You can run the numbers and look at things. I tell you what, your subconscious and your gut and maybe one might say your animal instinct or this reptilian brain of ours will be <laughs> fighting against you and saying, go run for the hills and save yourself and we're all going to die. Uh, at least that's that's how I feel. I mean, there are days I'm like, oh gosh, what am I doing to myself? (laughs) Why did I ever go down this pathway? All your reptilian brain wants to do is flee for safety. Yeah. Where, you know, your logical brain says, look, man, we're going to get one client a month for the next year. They're going to pay us, you know, it's going to work out. It's going to work out. And your brain's like, I need to eat. (laughs) (laughs) Someone needs to feed me. You see, the money's not coming in. It's going out the door. It just keeps going out the door, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
we're used to getting a paycheck and that's not working. You know, all you want to do is go back and drive the truck and know that that check is coming in. So it takes nerves of steel. <laughs> well, for sure. For us, I was employed partially on the side driving truck. So we had saved up a chunk of money and then I part-time started the business and was doing that on the side while driving truck. I had worked out a schedule with the trucking company to be able to do it part-time. So I was doing the business half of the week doing truck driving the other half of the week. So we didn't have enough coming in from truck driving. to f It supplied all our personal needs. I wasn't happy or confident about the idea of it also supplying the business needs. So that's what the chunk of money was for. And so little by little, you know, the business was pulling down off of those. And, you know, yeah, we were losing money. I mean, the first couple of years of the business operation, we showed a loss. We only incurred more in expenses than we generated in revenue. And it stayed that way for probably the first two years before it was things had reversed around and we were actually bringing in more revenue than expenses. Thankfully, I mean, we're very much things grow and develop. You know, we have a reliable source of income for ourselves. So I think having some means to continue to satisfy that personal is really critical and some means to keep that business running. It's very much like a baby. <laughs> At some point, maybe they could take care of you. You know, maybe your children can help you out and be a source of support for you, but, but it's not going to happen as an infant or a toddler, right? <laughs> I mean, you're the one taking care of them. So maybe more important than the business plan is the personal plan and knowing what your expenses are and having all of that locked in and being able to know what your transition is going to be from a steady job to your financial independence job. How does that leap look? Oh, completely. Yeah. I think that's a nice way to end and put it together, Andrew, because I really think that in the early stages of a business, especially as you are learning and you're just transitioning into this as a new business owner, managing the personal is probably more important than managing the business. Learning how to do the business is really just you showing up and, you know, I'm going to spend time on this and give myself time, give myself the freedom, the permission to fail and learn and get better. And then the personal side is just how long? <laughs> how long can you do that? How long can I fail for? <laughs> how long right. do I have to show up and figure this out? Yeah. Yeah, before maybe the spouse, uh, husband or wife, <laughs> yeah. your partner says, you know, that's enough. You know? <laughs> that's a, I'm glad you have a hobby here, but <laughs> it's time to go make some money, bud. This isn't a business. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I hope you had fun. <laughs> so there you go. That's our thoughts on the finances of a business plan and the beginnings of a business plan and what we think you should do. We'll kick it off into other topics. But as one quote to leave you with for the day, some people dream of success while other people get up every morning and make it happen. Well, isn't that truth? Some people dream of success while other people get up every morning and make it happen. Be sure you're one of those other people who get up every morning and make it happen. Don't just dream about this, folks. Let's make it happen. You're going to love yourself for doing it. All right. Check in with us to our next episode. Thanks for listening. I hope you've had as much fun as we did. If you'd like to learn more about any of the subjects we spoke about, please visit our website for show notes, links, and more. Hit like, subscribe, or whatever button you've got in front of you to show some love. Remember, the information presented in this podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Remember what Teddy Roosevelt said about the person who strives greatly. If he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Until next time, keep striving. Thanks again, and be well. <laughs>